morning, church. Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? We're gonna work with the living God this morning.
gosh, I love how declarative that song and how reaffirming it is. I don't know if you guys might, might have had a hard week like I had, um, but just the power of our words, God has given us a gift to kind of proclaim his truths over our lives. He says who he says, we are who he says he is. Uh, who, <laughs> excuse me. We are who he says we are, amen. And uh, this morning, as we're gonna continue worshiping this next song, we're gonna uh, sing about how all of creation sings how holy he is. And if creation who does not have words can sing of his praises, how much more can we, amen? Come on, we're gonna declare this together. God, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness and your holiness. God, when we are weak, you are strong. God, we thank you that we can rely on you always. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the land. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the land. Your name is the highest. Your name 
deserves an applause for the one true king. We bring God the glory this morning, his holiness and his goodness. You can be seated as we continue to worship the true and living God. Man, that song, I don't know what it does to you, but I know what it does to me. It just draws me back to the glory and the goodness of God, his majesty. It's so awesome to come into a room and sing that with other people because it's also just sort of a foreshadowing of eternity, right? It's foreshadowing of us worshiping together, um, all of the believers together uh, under the banner of the King. And so welcome to, to worship this morning. My name is Jeremiah, I'm one of the pastors here. And if you are new and just joining us for the first time, we wanna welcome you, I want you to feel comfortable. Um, we wanna invite you to connect with us if you'd like to. The easy way to do that is to take your phone out and hit the CC tag in front of you on the chair in front of you. Uh, it's like a little tag back there and it'll pop up a website on your phone automatically and it'll give you a bunch of information about how to connect with us. We've got lots of ways to connect. And so we're doing a lot of great things this summer and one of those things and one of those ways to connect is Summer at CC. And so how many people have been to Summer at CC this summer? I wanna see a sh show of hands, okay. All right, three of you have been. Okay, some people in the back. Uh, Summer CC, it's been a fun time to fellowship with uh, just you know new families or families that have been here for forever. It's a great way to connect. Uh, it's on Wednesday nights. We've got four left in the month of January, or January, the month of July. And uh, during Wednesday nights, we start at 5.30, we have a meal, and then around 6.30, we, we kind of do a, sort of a table discussion. Kids go their own separate ways. And then after that sort of like table discussion, um, and hanging out and fellowshipping and, and learning together. We have, uh, some, sometimes we have food trucks, we have ice cream trucks, we have all kinds of uh, ways to connect afterwards. So we wanna invite you to that. It's next four Wednesdays through the end of July. It's a great way to connect and just meet new people. I've been able to meet quite a few new people myself and I've just enjoyed it. Uh, the other thing that is happening this week and is really exciting is our Spain 1700 initiative. And this is part of our rooted campaign um, to just, reach the world for Christ. And um, we start here in Jacksonville, but that spreads globally through our initiative in Spain where we are going to be sending teams. In fact, Pastor Jason is there now preparing for the teams to come and join him. Uh, but we have 39 folks leaving throughout the week this week to be there for two weeks to pray uh, and to walk through the whole country, joining 70 other partners from North America uh, to pray for the country of Spain, to initially sort of set the um, bar, plant the seeds for um, planting some house churches. And so the goal would be to be in 17 regions and start 100 new house churches. And so let's be in prayer for them this week as they travel. We're very excited to hear the stories that are gonna come back from that as they pray throughout the country and they map kind of the region kind of figure out where the partners are going to be and the partners that are there helping them understand the lay of the land. But it starts with prayer. And so everything we do here, we wanna start with prayer. Uh, and we just wanna thank you for giving towards that initiative. Uh, it's really helping us to continue to move the mission forward here at Christ Church. If you do wanna give too, you can do that on the tag or out in the lobby at the little uh, giving boxes. So a lot going on. We're gonna to continue to worship this morning um, through a message, and we're gonna finish with communion and singing. So let's just bow our heads and our hearts now as we just continue to worship together. God, we thank you for this moment, for this time, that unique opportunity to be in a room with a unique group of individuals. You providentially brought us together um, to hear, to listen, to have eyes that see and, and hearts that believe again in the gospel. So teach us about forgiveness and confession this morning as Jeremy prepares to preach. Uh, give him words of wisdom to, to say. Look how we pray for the folks that are gonna be going uh, to Spain, the folks that are already there for that country, and we pray that the gospel would be brought anew and afresh um, from, through our teams and through what we're doing. So we just pray all of this in Jesus' great and mighty name. Amen. Ever since the garden, we've been picking up the pieces. What's God's vision for my life? What's God's vision for my relationships? 
what's God's vision for my marriage? And what's God's vision for my family? Where do we even look for direction at this time? Somewhere along the way, we ate from the wrong tree. We became faithful to the wrong thing. It's time to look back and ask the author over everything what's best for our lives and to make a bold decision to live committed. Morning, church. How we doing? You guys good this morning? Good. My name is Jeremy. I'm excited to hang out, get to talk about Jesus with you guys a little bit today. Before we get into it, uh, Jeremiah just hit a little bit on this, but I feel like I gotta double down a little bit on two big things that are happening in the life of our church this week. Uh, number one, this is kind of close to my world. Number one, we leave tomorrow for CIY Move with 200 of our high school students. And so that's like a big deal in, in our student ministry. Adult leaders, students, it's gonna be an incredible week. This is like, I was doing the math, this is my 15th summer, I'm getting old. This is my 15th summer doing these kind of trips with, with teenagers and I've just seen so much of the goodness of God in the next generation on trips like this. I've seen so many relationships formed, seen so many students drawn to Jesus. I've seen so much discipleship over, the, over those summers. And so if you could just join us in praying for the team that's headed to Tennessee for CIY Move with all of our adult leaders that are going, that they would have energy and boldness and the right words at the right time, that our students would be ready to receive the good news of Jesus, that he would speak into their lives. So it's gonna be an incredible week. We're actually gonna be talking about rest with high schoolers, talking about how their lives are so jam-packed full that maybe there's too much for them to hear Jesus sometimes. So I don't know, maybe that's a lesson for us too. Yeah. Another whole other sermon, I don't know. Anyway, that's, that's the first thing. Be praying for our students this week at CIY. Second thing, Jeremiah just mentioned, but I just wanted to mention as well that our team is headed to Spain this week. And man, I got to, I've got i gotten to be there a couple times over the past year. I got to go with a group of our high school students as well. And like, I just wanna reiterate that Jesus is already on the move in Spain. And we are getting to go be a part of what he is doing. I got to hang out with a few um, from uh, of our missionaries there, as well as just some people from their churches. And one of our missionaries, actually, this line, I think it caught all of our high schoolers off guard a little bit. And then I realized later that it kind of caught me off guard. And, you know, I was like really focused on them, but later he, somebody asked him, hey, why are you a missionary? That's what they said, why are you a missionary? And he said, because I'm a Christian. And it like caught me later that he wasn't just like, not that every Christian should be a missionary, but that every Christian should live on mission. And it kind of caught me later that that's what he was talking about. And man, let me tell you, the church in Spain is doing just that. They are living on mission. They might be few, but they are living on mission, intentionally leading their country back to Jesus. So be praying for our team. Actually, Jason next week is bringing the message from Spain. So that'll be pretty cool. Um, he'll be in Spain bringing God's word to us from over there. So I'm excited about that as well. So be praying for our high schoolers head to CIY. Be praying for our team that's headed to Spain this week. Now, I wanna talk about something. I wanna have a conversation. I'm gonna have to do a little explaining here because I wanna talk about commercials. You guys know what commercials are? Uh, if you're under 30, they're kind of like ads, but you can't skip them and you can't pay to have them removed, okay? If, does that make sense? And they don't have a countdown timer, okay? Like you don't know when you need to be back to watch your show. So like back in the day, do you guys remember this? Like has time flown this crazy? Like do you remember back in the day you had one shot to watch a show or to watch a movie or to watch a sporting event? You couldn't rewind it, right? Like Tuesday night at nine o'clock, your butt had to be on the couch or else you weren't gonna know what happened in season four, episode 12 of whatever it might be. Not to mention, I just thought of this on the fly right now. Do you guys remember TV guides? You remember like going to the grocery store and buying a TV guide every week? Holy cow, that, I, that was a, that just blast from the past. That wasn't in the notes, that was free for today. Anyway, um, yeah, so like we had to sit down and watch shows, but I think commercials actually stuck with us more back in the day because you had no choice but to, like, you might have a, like, a three and a half minute window to run to the restroom, right? Or to go get a snack or to do what, you know, to have a conversation. But you never really knew when the commercial was going to end, right? And if you, there, there was no, like, heads up. The show just started again. And if you didn't want to miss it, you had to stay locked in. You couldn't rewind 10 seconds. You couldn't go back and catch it the next week. You had to be locked in 
from the jump. And so I think commercials actually, while ads today still have, like we still get their jingles, right? Like they still get into our brains and stuff. I think back then those commercials stuck with us like so much more significantly than they do today because we were stuck watching them. This is crazy. Did you know that one, almost one third of everything you watched was commercial back in the day, right? Like if you watched a one hour show, that show was actually like 42 minutes, which meant there were 18 minutes of commercial. That's just how it was. And so I think these things stuck in our brains a little bit more. Do um, you guys remember the Verizon guy? The can you hear me now guy? That then went to Sprint or something, didn't he? Every dad in the world was making dad jokes when, they, when cell phones became a thing. Every dad that ever got on the phone was like, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? It's like, dad, come on. It's not funny anymore. Like, it wasn't even funny the first time you tried. You know what I mean? Like, like uh, finish this sentence. Yo quiero Taco Bell, right? Like, that. how many of you, that was the first Spanish you ever learned, you know? <laughs> right? Like, that's, like, they it just stuck with us. And not only did they stick with us, but they actually, like, would become a part of our regular vocabulary when, when they weren't a part of the commercial. Like, uh, finish this one. Silly rabbit tricks are... For kids, right? And how many times after that commercial would you like jokingly call somebody a silly rabbit? Like they became a part of our, uh, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline, right? Like these things like became a part of our everyday language somehow. Well, recently, this is a, a more recent commercial or ad, sorry. I don't know, how old am I? Jeez. Anyway, more recent ad that I've, that I've picked up on. But I noticed the other day that I use this thing in a, in a sentence, in a conversation to try to describe something. And all of a sudden I realized that this, this like phrase that I've never, hold on, can I pause real quick? I forgot, I can't believe this happened to me. I forgot the most important commercial of all time, okay? You just finish this, I'll do the tune and then you can do the words, okay? It goes like this, ba da ba 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 I'm loving it. That's my McDonald's, come on. McDonald's, anybody? That's my, that's my, okay, anyway. So, sorry, back to what I was actually talking about. So there's this commercial that I started using in everyday language and I didn't even realize that. Have you guys seen the Febreze commercial where uh, the, somebody's like living in a pigsty but they don't know it? Have you guys seen this commercial? And, and then they like, Febreze comes in and they, they call this person nose blind. Have you seen that? So like essentially somebody's like living in this pigsty, but you know when like you, you live in something, you like stop slowly over time realizing the effects of that thing and then and like all of a sudden it's not until somebody else comes in that's like, oh it stinks in here, right? Like it's one of those situations and they call it nose blind. Man, that's so, that's like actually good. Like you could use that. Like, like I don't know if you have kids at all, but this is just the reality in my house. Like, you just get used to stuff being everywhere all the time, right? Like there's just, it, whether it's trash or crumbs or toys, like it, it just, it's Tuesday, right? And you don't really notice it. You just step over shoes and all the things all the time until somebody's about to come over for dinner and then all of a sudden you're like, we live in a pigsty, right? Everybody get to work right now. You know what I'm saying? Like we just become used to living in the things that we're around all the time and we become nose blind to them. This summer we've been in this series called Committed talking about these like habits of godly marriages, right? That these habits that if we wanna grow together, if we wanna pursue Jesus in our marriages, that we would have these habits and that they would be on display in our marriages and in our other relationships as well. Just a friendly reminder, we didn't just go to AI and say, what are your six pro tips for marriage? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not like this is like a, uh, you know, a thing on, online that you can just click and find the seven tips to a healthy marriage. We simply just looked at Jesus and whatever, whatever he's got, whatever he wants for our lives, whatever, however he lived, we wanna find a way to take that and apply it to our marriages. How does Jesus, how does the way Jesus lived apply to our marriages? We talked about things like love and grace and growth and so on and so forth, but all of these being habits to apply, they're like the overflow of what Jesus has done in our life, the applications of those, therefore, to our marriages. Well, today, uh, Jeremiah kind of just mentioned where we're headed. And I wanna acknowledge that I immediately, when I hear both the words confession and forgiveness, am likely to throw my walls up about 19 miles high, right? 
And I think it's because I actually know what I've become nose blind to. I'm like aware. I, I know what I've become nose blind to because I've kind of intentionally become nose blind to it. Like there's so many things in the darkness of my life, whether it's uh, sin or bitterness or anger or frustration or, or, or things that I've been holding on to that, that we so often just pile, uh, you know, spiritually or whatever, blankets on top of and we cover it up until it doesn't smell or at least doesn't smell too bad and then we just keep living our lives and we just walk around the pile every day as if it doesn't, if it's not there or if it doesn't really exist and if we don't think about it, then it's not there and we think that it doesn't affect us on the outside, right? We think nobody can really notice the bitterness or the, or the frustration or, or the anger or the resentment or the sin or, or what's deep inside of us. We think nobody else can notice those things when everybody else is walking around too. Sometimes it starts to affect the outside. Maybe we've become nose blind to some things in our lives because we've hidden them in the darkness. We've covered them up. We've actually gotten really good at and really used to walking around them. We've gotten used to them not tripping on them every day because it's out of self-preservation. We think that in order to have a healthy marriage, we actually need to conceal things. We think in order to, to, to be right in our relationships, we, we don't need to extend forgiveness. They should ask for forgiveness. So today, instead of maybe throwing our walls up 15 feet in the air and just being like, okay, Jeremy, you don't know what forgiveness and confession would actually do. It would actually, ta it would actually cause more harm than good. Maybe we can just lean into what God is doing to us today, not only in our marriages, in our relationships, our relationship with him, but maybe we could just lean in and see what God's spirit is trying to do in our lives today. Maybe, maybe there's a chance we become nose blind to some things in our life that maybe the Holy Spirit can start to identify to us today. But first, before we really get into it, I think we need to define what these terms confession and forgiveness are. So confession, I wrote this down. Confession, first of all, if I can, there it is. Confession, first of all, this is crazy. I used a dictionary this week, like a dictionary, you know? Um, like a dictionary has, has, if you didn't know, you can't, back in the day, you couldn't just Google. This is for the people that don't know what a commercial is. You couldn't just Google back in the day, right, what something meant. So I looked in this like theological dictionary what confession was, and it actually caught me off guard. The first definition of confession is to acknowledge the greatness of God, which caught me off guard, because what I thought the first definition of confession was gonna be was actually gonna be the second one here in a second. But the first one is that you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. A confession is a declaration that God is God, okay? But then number two, confession is to acknowledge or disown your sin, which is what I thought the primary definition would be, right? That, that we reveal something that's been hidden. That's what I thought confession mainly was. I didn't even think about how much these two go together. That our ability to reveal what's underneath the surface, maybe what we become nose blind to, is actually directly tied to our ability to have a right view of God, that God has the power to do something about the mess that we have made. That those two things are actually tied together. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. That in the confession in the revealing of what's been under the surface is actually the same moment that we're declaring that Jesus has the power to do something about it. So even in our marriages, we think that there is, um, we are sustaining a relationship by concealing something in the dark, right? The reality is, actually we're keeping Jesus from doing the healing work that he wants to do. Healing doesn't come from concealing, it comes from revealing. Too often, we become nose blind to the things that lay underneath the surface in our lives. We just avoid them, we walk around them, we don't look at them, we don't acknowledge the things in our lives. And as long as nobody else really knows, then it's okay too. But the reality is then Jesus can't do the work that he does that most of us in this room have declared at some point in our lives that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, that he is actually the one that can do something about the mess that we become nose blind to, even in our marriages. 
So we're actually withholding the healing that Jesus wants to bring to our marriages when we conceal what's hidden underneath. James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you will be healed. Not just confess your sins to God, confess your sins to your spouse and to one another so that you guys can pray together and so that you can be healed. That healing, that the process of healing starts in the unraveling of what we've become nose blind to because we've covered it up for so long. The confession is actually the beginning of everything we want in all of our relationships. We might, we, we, we have believed this lie for too long. We believe the lie for too long that concealing is what sustains the relationship. When in reality, confession is the only way that the relationship can grow, that the healing can begin. And Jesus is the one that can bring it. So first of all, confession is declaring that Jesus is Lord. And in the same breath, revealing what we've hidden underneath the surface, acknowledging that Jesus has the power to do something about it, even in our marriages. Forgiveness, however, is kind of like, uh, they're kind of like opposite sides of the same coin. Now I wanna acknowledge here right off the bat, you can't always control. Usually we need both sides of the coin. Sometimes you can't control the other side of the coin, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes you can't control the other person in this scenario, and our job is just to be faithful with our side of the coin, but sometimes we think of forgiveness as this thing that happens outside of us, like confession happens inside of us, right? Like we control confession, that's under our domain, so to speak. We control when we reveal, take off the, the layers and reveal the, the darkness inside of us. We control confession, but forgiveness, we tend to think, is dependent on someone else. Well, when they say they're sorry, then when they ask for forgiveness, then I, when, when they repent of what they've done, when they acknowledge their mistake, when, when, they, when they earn it, then, as if it's dependent on them, not dependent on us, but I think the reality is forgiveness is all dependent on us. We think that for some reason, when we withhold forgiveness, we're getting back at somebody for what they've done, as if, like, as if that's harming them, but withholding forgiveness is only harming ourselves. Again, I use my theological dictionary, which said that forgiveness, by definition, is the canceling of a debt. Forgiveness essentially is removing your ability to have a reason to retaliate for what someone has done. It's basically you saying, all right, uh, it doesn't mean that you trust them again, right? Like if, if, if somebody stole money from you, you can forgive them without handing them your wallet, right? Now, through the power of Jesus and the end goal of all healing and all relationships would be that one day again, you could trust them with, with your credit card, right? That would be the end goal. But forgiveness is not dependent on their repentance. It's not dependent on their apology. Forgiveness is us letting go of the, the, the anger, the bitterness, or the resentment that we have so buried underneath us that we are holding against someone that we've become nose blind to. We don't even realize the bitterness, the anger, the hatred that we've been holding underneath the service, surface for something someone did 20 years ago. For some reason we held on to that, thinking that they deserved it, as if it was hurting them, but in reality it's actually only hurting us. We're the ones living in the stink every day. It doesn't hurt them at all. Listen to this, this is crazy to me. Mark 11, okay, Mark 11, starting in verse 22. Then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in God, I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything and if you believe that you received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, this is it, when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Now, pause real quick. Uh, this passage has been abused theologically over the years um, to be an argument for the like prosperity gospel kind of things. I wanna be clear, that's not what Jesus is saying here. What I do believe Jesus is saying is that powered by the Holy Spirit, your prayers have the ability to move mountains. 
not for your own name and for your own sake, but for the name and the glory and the fame of Jesus, that you, you have the ability by way of the Holy Spirit to pray mountain-moving kind of prayers. But did you catch the last, last verse? But first, you better check yourself because your ability to pray mountain-moving prayers is directly tied to your ability to forgive people who have wronged you in your life. So before you go and try to pray a mountain-moving prayer, before you go and try to pray for Jesus to show up in the kind of ways that only he does, Jesus is like, first you better check what you've been hiding underneath the surface, what you become nose blind to. You better check and make sure you're not holding any bitterness or anger or rage towards someone for what they did. First forgive them and then come pray your mountain moving prayers. It's crazy. Now Jesus, we'll talk about this in a minute, Jesus always puts his money where his mouth is, right? Jesus isn't asking us to do something that he isn't doing himself. But it's crazy to me that he directly ties our ability to pray these prayers to our ability to forgive. Jesus' last words on the cross, actually, um, Jesus says, it is finished from the cross, which is the Greek word, and I'm no Greek theologian, so forgive me if I'm mispronouncing this, but it, it's the Greek word tetelestai, and tetelestai means it is finished. It's a, we've been translating it that way for 2,000 years. I, I, from what I understand, it's a completely accurate translation. I'm not saying it's not by any means, but what I did find out this week was that a couple hundred years after Jesus died, rose again, went back to heaven, a couple hundred years later in the ancient Near East, uh, some receipts started popping up around the known world that were like stamped with the word tetelestai on them. You're telling me that Jesus on the cross, his last words were like stamped with the word tetelestai as in a debt had been paid, as in, as in a debt had been forgiven, as in some, a payment had been made on behalf of a debt that was owed. That's crazy to me. Like there, there's no coincidence in my mind that Jesus didn't know exactly what he was saying when he was on the cross and he said, it is finished, but also in the same breath said, their debt has been paid. They have been forgiven. Jesus prayed some mountain moving kind of prayers. But I think those mountain moving kind of prayers were actually directly tied to the forgiveness of others. I think that's what Jesus is getting at in Mark 11. You wanna pray big prayers? First check the relationships you've become nose blind to, maybe for decades even, and extend forgiveness even if it's not earned or asked for. So change is gonna, we're gonna say this, change is gonna start with confession, but it's gonna be tetelestide, it's gonna be stamped with forgiveness. There are opposite sides of the same coin, that we can't always control the other side of the coin. We aren't always uh, able to decide if someone confesses or not. We're not always able to decide if someone forgives or not. More often than not, we need to do a little bit of both. But in any case, God has called us to be the kind of people in our marriages that lead with confession, that lead with forgiveness. I think there's a chance that we become nose blind to the fact that we do need these things. Maybe you're sitting there thinking, no, in my marriage, I'm mostly good. Like, they're the one that, <laughs> that's probably a sign that forgiveness and confession are needed, right? I've been carrying my way over here. If they would just, in our relationships, in our marriages, the healing process can begin when we reveal what's under the surface in our own life, our own desires, our own past, our own failures, our own sin. When at the same time, being ready to extend forgiveness for someone else's, both sides of the same coin. We're gonna dive into Romans 12 here, which Romans 12 is a uh, pretty famous chapter in the Bible, actually, that starts with Paul talking to the Roman church about how they are called not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed to look more like Jesus that our goal in marriages, if we apply it that way, that our goal in our marriages is not to look like all the marriages around us. It's not be, to be conformed or just to be better than the marriage down the street. Our goal is to look more and more like Jesus in our marriages, not to be conformed, but be transformed into the image of Jesus. 
And then Paul's going to go on this rant of if we, are, if we are transformed instead of being conformed, if we're starting to look more like Jesus, here are the things that will overflow in our marriages. Here are the things that will overflow in our lives. And I think we could just go down a list and we could, we could, use, this, we could use this passage to, to show what confession and forgiveness do in our lives and what they require us to do in order to have that healing begin. So we're gonna pick it up in Romans 12, starting at verse nine. Paul says, don't just pretend to love others, really love them. We're gonna say forgiveness and confession require compassion. Paul says, don't just love people, like actually love people. You know, like, don't just feel in love with people, right? Like, because that, that, like, feeling, that emotion can come and go at times. Don't just feel in love. Actually love them. And in order to forgive, forgiveness requires a kind of love that, that, that doesn't have a feeling. Listen, you are not always going to feel like forgiving. You are basically never going to feel like confessing in the moment. But knowing that Jesus has called you to it and knowing that it leads to healing, knowing that you can see the other person, that you can have a right view of God, that he has the power to do something about it, and that you can have a right view of your spouse, that your desire, your heart, if you love them, is what's best for, you wanna do what's best for them, not necessarily even what's best for you, that you can have compassion on them to do what is best in their best interest. Don't just love your spouse, really love your spouse. Keep going in that verse. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Paul is saying, forgiveness requires self-control. Because in the moment, uh, when, when someone has wronged you, forgiveness is, a, or sorry, self-control is a fruit of the spirit, right? In the moment when someone has wronged you, rarely do your emotions feel like forgiving. Rarely in the moment do you feel like confessing. But in those moments, be of sober mind, Paul would say. Be self-controlled. Pay attention, don't just react in those moments. Lean in, take a deep breath, go the Jesus way instead of your way. Be transformed, not conformed. Have self-control, take a deep breath, and do the right thing in the moment. Extend forgiveness. Confess what is hidden, what we become nose blind to underneath the surface. Keep going, verse 10. Love each other with a genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Forgiveness requires sacrifice. Work hard, never be lazy, uh, show genuine affection, honor each other, serve the Lord. If we're going to forgive, it's going to take our way disappearing. We're gonna sa have to sacrifice our own desires. We're gonna have to sacrifice our own ones. If we're gonna be able to forgive, we're gonna have to be able to lay them down in order for what's best, not only for our marriage, but what's best for our spouse, what's best for the other person in the relationship. Verse 12, rejoice in confident hope, be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that the God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Forgiveness requires humility. More than likely you messed up too, right? Sorry, we, I'm in this. This wasn't, that wasn't a dart I was throwing at you. More than likely we messed up too, right? We, we aren't always right and we didn't always do the right thing and even if we think we did, who knows what it looked like from their perspective. So forgiveness and confession both require an amount of humility to see maybe there's a chance that I played a part in this too. They aren't all bad and I'm not all good in this scenario. It takes humility to see that we don't know it all. Verse 17, and this is good here. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are on, that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live at peace with everyone. And other translations would say, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Forgiveness requires surrender, which might sound a little bit like sacrifice, but I don't think it's like surrendering things. I think forgiveness and confession both require us to have the ability to say, 
All right, Jesus. I called you Lord and I called you Savior. And if you're both, then it might be time to uncover what I've been hiding in the dark. In our marriages, it might be surrendering and finally saying, okay, I realize that withholding this leads to destruction and I need to lay it down so that the healing can begin. The section figure finishes out like this. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that, righteous, uh, leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Paul's like, just forgive. Let Jesus take care of the rest. Um, by the way, Jesus' revenge is not the reason you should forgive. <laughs> like, it's not like, I'll forgive them. Jesus will zap them to no tomorrow, right? Like, that's not the reason. But, but I think Paul's just saying, don't worry. God's got your back. It's two sides of a coin. You control the part that you can control, right? You do your job. God always does his job. And then it says, instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them, right? If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals of shame on their heads. <laughs> uh, again, I don't think that's the goal, right? I think the goal is to love them like Jesus. God will do his part, right? Then I love this, 21. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing don't just let evil stir in the darkness underneath the surface. And I'm guessing that we've started to become nose blind to the things that we've actually hidden under the surface to the point that we think they don't actually matter, to the point that we think they don't actually impact us, to the point that we think that people don't notice what's going on. We become nose blind to these things. But if we want the healing to begin, we have to overcome evil with good. Just so we're on the same page, the only good in this world is named Jesus. We have to overcome evil with Jesus. We have to peel back the layers and bring into the light of Jesus the darkness that's been hiding inside of us. And when we do, here's what's gonna be produced. Forgiveness produces appreciation. Have you ever been forgiven? Tell me in that moment that you were forgiven that there wasn't an immediate thank you. Tell me there wasn't an immediate like sigh of relief on the inside when forgiveness and confession, confession I've set across the table from so many people that have shared so many things like and how often as soon as it comes out of their mouth, they're like, oh my goodness, that's a weight that's been released and how long we've been holding that in. But confession and forgiveness produce that appreciation. What about forgiveness produces patience? That it leads us to Maybe take a, take a breath and see that they're human too and that, and that we can be patient with them, that maybe they're growing too, that maybe they haven't made it yet just like we haven't made it yet. Forgiveness produces unity. How Man, just take a second and look at the relationship between us and Jesus. The forgiveness that Jesus displayed on the cross is the only reason that unity is even attainable or even is a possibility in our lives, in our relationships, in our marriage. And man, could forgiveness and confession bring unity to our marriages? Forgiveness also produces love. That when we forgive, there might be this tendency to think that withholding forgiveness and withholding confession will actually lead to the love being sustained. <laughs> because if they don't know, then, 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 then the love can continue. In reality, it's just the opposite. For the healing, the growth to begin in our marriages, there's the demand for confession and forgiveness. So the obvious question might be, so then how do we do it? Like, what does that even look like? How do we actually forgive? I know these aren't easy things. How do we actually confess? Like, these are not simple things. Some of this stuff we've been nose blind to for 30 years. Like, this isn't, this isn't just like a, it doesn't necessarily feel like a rip off the Band-Aid kind of situation. So what do we do? I'm gonna give you four words. Decide, depend, obey, and hope. Sometimes we do make a decision. We decide right now. I don't know if anybody's ever gone cliff jumping before, like into a lake or something, but you never go look at the cliff to make a decision on whether or not you're gonna jump in or not, right? Because every time you get up there, if you're just like scoping it out, you're never jumping, right? You are, sometimes you gotta decide from the ground that you're jumping before you even get up there to jump, 
right? Like sometimes you gotta make a decision. I'm gonna reveal what's been hiding under the surface. I'm going to extend forgiveness. And maybe the best reason to do it is because Jesus said so. I know that seems silly how often I say to my kids, because I said so. When in reality, like I simply know something about the situation that they don't know. Clearly, forgiveness and confession are at the heart of God. That your ability to pray mountain moving prayers is tied to our ability to forgive. So sometimes I think we just gotta trust that Jesus actually knows what's best for our marriage and trust and make a decision that we are gonna confess and we are gonna forgive. And then we have to depend. Uh, actually, uh, Jesus in John chapter 20 is going to tie our ability to forgive to the Holy Spirit. That forgiveness is not really in our nature. But because Jesus brought it, we have the ability to forgive. We have the ability to confess. Not because we have it in ourselves on our own, but because of the presence of Jesus. And then we do have to obey. And I don't mean obedience in the sense of we do it because Jesus said so. That was, that was the other one. I think we have to obey in that when we forgive and when we confess, the work isn't done. Romans 12 just listed a whole list of things. As far be it as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Just because you forgive doesn't mean you're done working. Give a drink to those who are thirsty. Feed those who are hungry. Overcome evil with good. Just because you say I forgive you doesn't mean you can wash your hands of it and say, all right, that's all that I'm done now. There's more work to be done. We have to continue to obey Jesus in confession and forgiveness. And then finally, we hope. We put our hope and our trust in Jesus. The ultimate healer, the real restorer, the one that can fix what's been broken. There's too much under the surface that we become nose blind to. And my guess is the Holy Spirit over the last 30 minutes has kind of been stirring in you. And my guess is that, that you're, you're realizing some things that you might have put layers on top of time and time again. That now you know, man, I got to bring these to the surface so that the healing can begin. Two sides of the same coin. In Matthew chapter 18, though, uh, there's this funny interaction between Jesus and Peter. That ha actually happens a lot of times, but there's this funny interaction between Jesus and Peter. Peter comes up to Jesus one day, and he, I think he thought he was gonna look real smart to Jesus. He comes up to Jesus and he's like, hey Jesus, how many times should I forgive someone who wronged me? Hear me out, Jesus, how about this? What if I forgive somebody seven times? Like, check me out. Like, that'd be uber forgiveness. Like, wouldn't that be nuts if I was that holy, Jesus? And I wasn't there, so this is the Jeremy version, but I just imagine Jesus like patting Peter on the head like he's like a five-year-old saying, good try, buddy. You almost got it. And then Jesus fires back with Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. And I just imagine Peter being like, ooh, a swing and a miss, you know? Like, like, like Jesus leans in and he's like, and Jesus wasn't saying that number 78, you don't have to forgive them. He was saying 77 as in the sense of you never stop forgiving. And my goodness, did Jesus put his money where his mouth was? How many times have we had to run back to Jesus and confess and receive forgiveness from Jesus? And how much joy and peace and restoration has that forgiveness brought to our lives? How could we not be the ones, if we have been forgiven, how could we not be the ones to extend that forgiveness to our spouse, to our friends, our family. Jesus has forgiven us more times than we could ever count. Not only that, but he to tell us that he paid the price for our sins and the things that we've had to confess. He stamped our debts and said they have been paid in full. How could we not bring the same thing to our marriages? As hard as confession might be, it's the beginning of healing. And as hard as forgiveness might be, it leads to healing. I think we've just believed this lie for far too long. That actually if we just bury it and don't think about it and forget it's there, then it'll go away and the relationship will be sustained. But sustaining the relationship was never the goal. Growing, healing, restoration, unity, love, 
those are the goals in our relationships and in our marriages. And they're gonna start with habits that look a lot like confession, that look a lot like forgiveness. And I can't think of a single thing that looks more like Jesus than when we forgive someone who's wronged us. That leads my mind straight to the cross. Let's pray as we move into communion. Jesus, we come to you this morning in a time of communion, a time where we turn our attention towards you. I think it could probably said, I don't know if this is actually true or not, but I think it could probably said, be said that we never look more like you than when we forgive someone who's wronged us. So God, I pray that in our confession and our forgiveness today, that we would just see your cross, that we would be reminded that we have been forgiven and how could we not extend that forgiveness as well? So Jesus, right now our eyes are on you. We see you for who you are. We see you for what you've done. We take this bread together right now to remember the the life that you gave up so that we could have ours. Go ahead and take the bread together. In the same way, Jesus, we take this cup to remember the blood that you poured out that now through the Holy Spirit runs in our veins and gives us the power in this moment to confess and to forgive. Go ahead and take the cup together now. Jesus, you modeled everything that you've been calling us to. You're calling us into a better way. You're calling us to be transformed, not just to look more like the people around us or the world around us, but to look more like you. And we gotta believe that what you said, that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So God, reveal to us now what we've become nose blind to in our lives so that our marriages can look more and more like you. Jesus, we love you the most. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand.
Amen, amen. We hope you have a wonderful day, church. If you wanna get connected or you wanna give, tap that tag in front of your chair. If you need a prayer this morning, come on down to the front. We'll have some people to pray for you. We'll see you guys again next week.